Joining me now is UNHCR Senior External Relations Officer, Mr. Roland Schoenbauer. Welcome to Diplomatic Channel. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. You've been in Nigeria since October 2020. Um, how are you finding the country so far? I really like Nigeria. It's a diverse country with a very open population, also open to receiving refugees, as we see in the south, where the Cameroonians keep on trickling in. It's also a country that is uh, seeing a lot of violence and displacement, not only from outside into Nigeria, but also inside Nigeria. 2.9 million uh, Nigerian men, women and children are not living in their home. Uh, they have been displaced. Uh, so it's, it's characterized by violence, by displacement, but also by generosity. When we look at how the government responds to, to the Cameroonians, 65,000 in the south, uh, the government gives them access uh, to health facilities alongside Nigerians. Refugee boys and girls can go to school alongside Nigerians. And refugees can work, can, can work on their, their fields if they can rent fields, they, they can um, build up little businesses. And this is not a given. If we compare to other countries, they have not gotten that far. They have not been so realistic in dealing with the refugee situation that is far from being over. So the conflict on the other side of the border continues and we have to be realistic. And the government here is realistic. It gives the refugees a, the, the possibility to get back on their feet and to make a contribution to the Nigerian society and economy. This is commendable and UNHCR supports the government not only with my words, but also financially by helping expand schools and health facilities so that uh, refugees can be received alongside Nigerians. I know you, the UNHCR focuses on refugees coming from Cameroon, but now the focus seems to be on the internally displaced persons. So you have visited some of those camps. What is your assessment there? I've been to some of these IDP camps, uh, like camps all over the world. It's only uh, the last resort if there is no other uh, way of receiving uh, people. Uh, luckily, in the case of the Cameroonians, uh, the refugees, it's not really camps, it's settlements, and many live in the communities. For the IDPs, camps seem to be inevitable because of the insecurity around, but they are overcrowded. People are uh, not having a lot of uh, privacy uh, and they, 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 they suffer from not being able to, to do what they used to do. They cannot go outside the camp a lot to, to work or to, to earn a living. So they, they depend both on, on the protection that UNHCR and others are providing and they depend on, on, on aid and humanitarian assistance that uh, different organizations are, are providing them in the camps. Uh, it's again not a, a sustainable situation, uh, but uh, the insecurity that prevails and that is even growing uh, outside with, with uh, attacks on IDP camps and on IDPs uh, on the road uh, it makes it impossible to, to uh, bring people out of camps in, in larger numbers. With refugees, supplies are never enough. So how does the UNHCR help to meet these needs? Uh, food, water, medicine, you know, providing life as normal as possible for these people. In Nigeria, like in around the world, when it comes to internal displacement and, and, and the help for IDPs, uh, the humanitarian community had, has a certain division of labor. Uh, in, in the case of Nigeria, the, the response is led by the deputy humanitarian coordinator and uh, different organizations have different tasks and different what we call sectors or areas where they support. UNHCR leads on protection. Uh, so we try to um, give people access to justice if they are living in a camp and so on and so forth. We also help with shelter. Uh, so uh, we uh, rebuild shelters when they are damaged by non-state armed groups in their attacks. Or we, we, we help expand uh, camps if need be. Uh, we also focus on non-food items such as cherry cans so that the IDPs can bring clean water, uh, mats uh, so that they have a place to sleep uh, and other non-food items and we help with, with camp management. But for food, medicine, education, it's others that, that lead. But we also work with a network of, of protection action groups across the Northeast. Uh, these are people that work with uh, these NGOs that work for us. So we have basically a network that helps us overcome 
this limited uh, space of maneuver that we have due to insecurity. We cannot go uh, everywhere in the Northeast. It's simply too dangerous. Only a living humanitarian is a good humanitarian. We cannot make a change, a difference in the lives of, of displaced people if we are killed. So there's uh, quite a limitation of what we can do. But through these networks of protection action groups and with other organizations, uh, we, we, we try to, to make a difference. We try to cope. And how, how is this possible again? With predictable and reliable donor support. This is not a given, but we are pleased that we have uh, the U.S. government and the U.S. people as a reliable partner in this. Uh, we just recently also got support from France and with uh, countries like, like the, those that I mentioned, but also Japan, uh, we can carry out some of the protection work. But yes, uh, we, we need more and we are glad also that Nigerians have started helping Nigerians through our IDP Refugee and Zakat Fund. My conversation with Mr. Sean Bauer continues in a moment. Please stay with us. Thirty-two camps in Nigeria tells you, you know, um, the situation of and how badly the security challenge is in the country. Um, for some especially children who are among the most vulnerable groups, women and children, but children especially. Um, what is the plan, you know, that the UNHCR has for helping them to, you know, have life as normal as possible, e either in the camps or, you know, as they transition back to normal life, um, you know, back to, you know, where they're coming from? Let me take you one step back. Uh, when it comes to, to IDPs, they're in the first place, Nigerian citizens, so the first uh, institution to, to look after them is the Nigerian government. Uh, but obviously we all know that it is challenging in the Northeast and that's why we as humanitarian community support the government in responding to the needs uh, of the IDPs and in helping them realize their rights. And yes, children have a right to education, like everybody else, for instance. How do, how, what does UNHCR contribute? First of all, we help assess their needs. We ask them from the first-hand perspective, what do you need? How do you do this? We, we organize what we call focus group discussions. So we bring together boys and have them discuss their needs for our assessment. We can think what is ideal for them, but let's, let's uh, hear their master's voices. The same for girls. They may not say what they need if they are put together with a large crowd. So that's why we have these focus group discussions for the needs assessment. Then we do vulnerability assessments. Uh, we make sure that as we don't have enough to give, as you rightly pointed out, we need to prioritize what we give for this vulnerability assessment helps us so that we can prioritize, for instance, uh, families where children have lost their father so that the, the mother is left with all the tasks that that parents uh, usually have and in displacement it's even even a more distressing uh, role they have to play so there we can prioritize uh, orphans uh, or, or people uh, children that don't have uh, a father uh, other activities that we have we have so-called safe spaces uh, for women and children inside camps so these are fenced areas where children have peace and quiet to play because it's not a given to play if you are packed together is, with, is, with others. Do you have this in all the camps or in most of the camps in Nigeria? I wish we would have it in all the camps but we are expanding these safe spaces um, also with the help of the government and people of Japan we are just about to, to build one more um, and in these spaces we also have dedicated rooms for survivors of uh, gender-based violence. So if someone uh, is referred to us uh, and we help with, with professional help, it's not for everybody to help a survivor of, of, of sexual violence, but with expert help, uh, psychosocial medical care, uh, they can spend the night in peace and quiet in a place behind the fence where we, we can make sure they are protected, which is uh, at the heart of what we do. And uh, speaking about safe places and security in the camps, physical presence of um, security operatives is also important, especially at these camps. And I'm sure that you're concerned at the UNAC and other UN agencies and uh, other uh, non-governmental organizations are concerned about the protection of staff in these places, in these camps. How does the UNHCR um, 
go about protecting its own staff and other volunteers who are at these camps? We have our security experts that are in touch with the security authorities uh, in, in the country and we make assessments and we continuously review our security measures, uh, be it armored vehicles for the way to the camps, uh, be it uh, that we have to withdraw from a camp if there is a, a, an incident uh, building up. Uh, and if you remember the, the attack uh, on Dikwa, uh, where there was a, a, also a bunker where humanitarian organizations uh, were working or, or, or protecting themselves inside, and even the, 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 the bunker was under siege by one of the uh, non-state armed groups. In this area, we have a partner organization working for us. But luckily, through our information flow, we ensured that our partners could flee uh, in time before uh, the, the bunker fell under siege. Uh, and, uh, and luckily, the bunker was not broken. Uh, and and uh, the, the humanitarians in that case uh, could, uh, could be saved. Do you feel there's enough security presence in these camps? Uh, it cannot be if attacks reach uh, until, uh, until the very people that uh, are there for the very purpose of protection. Uh, the camps are not there because uh, uh, there's no housing outside. They are there because it's so insecure outside. So they are meant to be kind of a, a safe haven or an island of security. <clears throat> and as we know, uh, some of the attacks by non-state armed groups have uh, reached and even uh, even hurt and, and, and killed people that uh, used to live in camps, either inside the camps or when they were on the road uh, nearby. Uh, so that's obviously not enough, but it's not for UNHCR to give advice on security matters. The, 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 the pertinent authorities are definitely aware of the challenge and, and they have to play their role like everybody else. Yeah, and I know that um, the UNHCR is concerned particularly about these 65,000 people who were recently displaced in the northeast uh, because of a series of attacks by armed groups on Damasak town. I believe that's in UB state. And unfortunately, there are more people being displaced by these non-state armed groups and their activities. Um, are you concerned, you know, that it really doesn't seem to be abating and there's no... The, the resettlement of these uh, internally displaced persons are not going on as fast as they should be. I mean, because if the security forces are doing their best, then people should be able to go back to where they're coming from. But you find that more people are being added to the camps than are leaving the camps. So let me unpack this a bit. Uh, yes, in, in Damasak we have seen massive displacement that hadn't been seen uh, in, in many months. So up to 65,000 people uh, fled from there. Most of them IDPs fled to the bushes, fled in, even across the border to, into the Republic of Niger, uh, where UNHCR is also l looking after them. Uh, and some of them tried to return. And that's, uh, that's the, 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 the sad situation that people are displaced over and over again. They, they restart their lives uh, in a camp, uh, then they, they feel uh, that's not enough that life has in them, uh, has in for them. Uh, so they, uh, they, they look for a better place, uh, a place with better food where they can look after themselves. They try to go back where they came from. They find out there is no food, there is no perspective. They cannot go back to their field because it's too insecure around their village. And then they go back to the camp. So it's a cycle of displacement that uh, is very, very concerning. Um, and uh, it's really important that, that the, the security issues are addressed. But again, uh, I'm, I'm stating the obvious here. And how is the UNHCR maneuvering? the challenges that the coronavirus pandemic poses, you know, to internally displaced persons because you can't have social distancing in these camps. So that must be challenging, right? Uh, it is challenging and, and uh, we are working with WHO and UNICEF on, on communicating the risks of uh, the pandemic uh, to uh, both IDPs but also the refugees uh, in the south. Uh, and we are uh, trying to uh, make a contribution when we do our border monitoring for those that 
are in, in pendular movements or that uh, flee from, from Cameroon into uh, Nigeria. So UNHCR and our partners, we are not only monitoring movements at the border, but we use this for temperature checks uh, and, and for, for raising awareness about how to protect themselves. Yes, physical distancing uh, is uh, a challenge or impossible in camps. Uh, uh, and we, we hope and pray that uh, all the preventive measures um, prevent the worst. Mr. Roland Schoenbauer, thank you so much for speaking with me on Diplomatic Channel. Thank you for having me. Thank you.